So anyways, my personal medical doctor, Dr. Maria, uh, totally fucking wingmanned us on Twitter. That's, I think wingmanned is an appropriate term here. Yeah. When, yeah. when Sir Michael Grant, uh, <laughs> Sir Michael Grant has been knighted by her majesty. <laughs> the queen, obviously. Uh, okay. Sir Michael Grant's a, a fake title, but Maria is actually a doctor. So please doctor. Thank you. Everybody refer to her by her title. Thank you. Anyways, uh, Michael Grant forgot about a Zoom meeting, and so our our doctor went on there and was like, yo, why don't you talk to some Animorphs podcast, except she said it much cooler because she's a doctor. And um, he was like, sure. And I was like, listen, I talked to you once on a letters to thing, which was totally different, and we couldn't say fuck, and I want to say fuck and talk to you. And he was like, I love saying fuck, DM me. And so we did. <laughs> And this is the story of how we got here. And I just wanted to tell it so that everybody knew that Dr. Maria was the one that did it. And also that I've been writing her name on all of my medical forms for a while now. And those are the two things I needed to get out of the way. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> now everyone, Michael Grant. Are we doing opposite sides? How can we tell which side it's gonna be? I... Oh, I don't know, cause it's probably like inverse. Because of mirroring and fuck, I'll go left. Let's just let's just vogue. <laughs> uh, I'm not even voguing correctly. There we go. There we go. This is why we never do video. <laughs> oh God, we have to leave. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> there he is. Hi. Can you see Hello. me? Yeah, we can. You're coming. Great. <laughs> How you doing? Sorry, I lost your window there for a minute, so I was wandering around trying to on the laptop here, trying to figure out what the fuck had happened to it. <laughs> Understandable. <laughs> yeah, I've done the same thing many times. So oh. How are you guys? Where are you, first of all? Um, I'm in Virginia. And yeah. I'm Illinois, so near Chicago. <laughs> I used to live in Evanston. Oh, oh that's right by me. So yeah. Nice. Okay, you know Blind Faith Cafe? I don't. There's a little business section right there anyway, right? It's uh, not far from campus, from Northwestern, south of there. Okay. We had a house there. It was the first house we were ever able to buy. And you know why we were able to buy it? Thank you. Because <laughs> <laughs> of us. <laughs> That's Absolutely. Funny. Animorphs money. The first time we weren't <laughs> renters ever. Um, and where's the Virginia person? There you are. Oh, hi. Um, yes, I'm in uh, Central Virginia, over by Charlottesville. So yeah, we have, uh, let's see. Uh, well, first of all, you know, between we've lived everywhere, and we have uh, we've, in Virginia, we lived in Newport News, uh, Richmond, Alexandria, um, and Catherine's parents were out in um, Smith Mountain Lake, <clears throat> in a little town out there, out you know near Tennessee, and then we used to live right over the mountains in Johnson City, Tennessee, but we lasted there for, I think, six months, seven months. That was a desperate times, <laughs> desperate <laughs> times. It was the most boring place we'd ever lived. There was nothing going on. You go down, like, the gas station was also a butcher. <laughs> that kind of place. And the, uh, the, only, the only entertainment was they had, uh, well, for that we were interested in was uh, they had Krispy Kreme. And they had a drive-up window. And they had a sign that said, Hot Donuts Now. And whenever the Hot Donuts Now sign was illuminated, we have to be anywhere near, naturally. So we just like put on huge amounts of weight and decided, oh, we have to get the fuck out of here. This isn't, <laughs> this isn't working for us. Um, so yeah, now I'm in LA. As a matter of fact, I'll give you the quick tour. I'm outside. This is I use I almost always work outside mm -hmm. um, when I can. And in California, that's most of the time. Or in LA, it's most of the time. Mm -hmm. My shed back there. If you that's the house. That's uh, actually that's where Catherine works right there in the window. She isn't at the moment. Um, but she's on a phone call, I think, with her agent. Um, and then beyond that, in that same direction, are the mountains. So we have a view that goes both ways. We get the mountains in one direction, and here I'll spin you around in my spinny chair. Ooh. You won't actually be able to see anything, but down there is down there is the pool, Sweet. and up there is the Griffith Observatory. And if you look behind that tree, which we can do from some angles, uh, you can see the Hollywood sign off in the distance. Wow. So, oh, that's yeah, that's why, awesome. we, that's, that's why we went for it. It was entirely the, the view. I mean, the house is fine. It's a little small, but the uh, the view, we're, we're both suckers for view. You know, let us look at something. 
that's always when we're looking at houses or any place to go, it's always thing number one, what am I looking at? If I'm not looking at a cityscape, which is excellent from downtown, like if I was in central London, ah, mm -hmm. that'd be great. Um, but failing that, I want to be able to see something. I want to have, you know, some room. Absolutely. So yeah. go ahead. You must have questions. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Um, okay. Do you want animorphs questions first or like yeah. general? What, what do you got? Sorry, I'm adjusting oh. my blanket here. It's, <laughs> I've got the, my, uh, it's actually pretty chilly here. And for some bizarre reason, this particular location I'm in is it, it's like a supernatural thing. It's always 10 degrees colder than everywhere else. I don't know why, except we get, you know, the wind goes freely through here, but it's always, even when it's nice out, this, I can come here and be cold. So it's kind of strange. <laughs> okay. So questions, anything, anything okay. you got, throw them at me. I'll see if I know. First of all, what's answer. cold for you? I'm just well, <laughs> see, this, is, this is the thing. I was actually born in LA. So I've lived in, uh, I, I think, 14 states and three foreign countries and over 50 different homes. So even within a state, as in Virginia, in multiple different locations, I've moved around a lot. And then uh, as a kid, because we were army, my dad was army. Um, and then uh, I just got into the lifestyle of moving around a lot. I liked it because, you know, you'd leave a place, you'd leave a school, uh, for example, when you're in school, and uh, you'd left behind everything everybody thought about you or how you were defined. Mm -hmm. You could completely redefine your play, yourself in the new place, in the new school. So I was a new kid in school every single year, except for once. Um, in Virginia, actually, and um, kind of got into that whole, you know, I like to be able to jump, move different places. Then I had other reasons for having to move, but we'll go into those maybe later. What was the question? I tend to be discursive, you know? Oh, no what worries. was the question again? I was asking, what What do you consider to oh, be cold? cold? So yeah. in any case, but I was born in LA and I lived the first five, I guess, six years of my life in LA. And it's, you know, that imprints on you at some level. So to me, weather should always be about 78 degrees fahrenheit maybe a cloud off in the distance otherwise the sun should be shining and any deviation from that irritates the hell out of me so i've lived for example in uh, minneapolis minnesota which oh, yeah. deviates quite a bit from that yeah uh, and i've lived in you know uh, hotter places and colder places and every time i'm just like a horrible baby about it and i whine about it constantly and I'm never ha happy until I'm here. It's it's L.A. or San Diego, Bay. even in the Bay Area, which God knows is not you know it's not Alaska. Uh, mm. It's pretty nice, but uh, there'd be more clouds and and uh, and a little bit less sun and a little bit more rain, and it would just annoy the hell out of me. It's just <laughs> stupid, I know, but I kind of feel like I'm here now. If I'm paying California prices and California taxes, the goddamn weather should be perfect all the time. Just <laughs> saying, that's. <laughs> And not on fire, preferably. Okay, go. Give me a question. Okay, um, in no particular order, just because it's the first one I have on my little list. Um, we would love to know a little bit about how the ghostwriting process worked for Animorphs. Yeah. So here's how it started. Uh, so we had, Catherine and I started as ghostwriters. I mean, our first gig in Kidlid was writing for Sweet Valley Twins. And they would pay us $3,000 a book. And we'd have to turn it around in two weeks, as you can see the training, you know, that went into this for three weeks, which is by the same time we had for an animorph to produce an animorph was three weeks. So we had done quite a bit of this. And when you wrote for Sweet Valley, they would send you an outline. Um, and the first book we wrote, 39, number 39, uh, we thought was, uh, we more or less stuck to the outline. And then after that, it was, we just became increasingly arrogant. It was like, eh. Fuck you, you know, we're not gonna go here. We'll take the title and the basic idea, everything else go away. And we ended up doing, I think, 17 books for them. So obviously, you know, they, they liked the net effect. So we were used to being ghostwriters and we'd written, we ghosted for um, uh, Girl Talk and for others, for others different series. Um, so when it came time for us, we thought, okay, first of all, we're gonna give credit, you know, in the book uh, because we never were given credit. No ghosts uh, at Sweet Valley were. Um, we're going to give them credit. We're going to pay well above market rate. So we took whatever was current at that time and basically doubled it, which is nice. It's 10 grand. Uh, against that, the fact that we were getting paid 100 grand for the book. <laughs> so you could see the kind of, so, you know, so we were wildly generous. We were above market rate and we gave the writers credit. And so we'd write outlines. Now, here's the problem. We both are not good at outlines. 
and we knew we weren't good at outlines and I never use, I've never used an outline. I, I don't even, you know, I just start writing. Um, so I don't think we produce the best quality outlines and we're also aware of the limitations of outlines. See, I, I always believe in writing spontaneously to the extent that's possible. You know, the uh, pantser versus planner, I'm the extreme pantser. I'll have an idea basically and then I'll start writing. And then in the first couple of paragraphs, I'll go, yeah, it's working or it's not working or here's what I'm going to need, you know, clarifies your thinking. So just jump in. Um, so we would give them instructions like, look, here's the outline. If you find a better way to do it, for God's sake, do it. If you find a cooler plot thread to, to chase, chase it, you know, we'll adjust later outlines. That, that'd be cool. You know, don't fuck with basic canon, but, you know, it, improvise. It, that didn't happen a lot. Um, and here, and the, the next problem with the process was that it, the manuscript after they wrote it would come back to us for editing. Mm -hmm. Well, Animorphs is six months out from publication, which means that that's half what you usually get. Normally you drop a book, you know, you hit send on the email and it, a year later, roughly 12 months later, a book shows up on the shelves. With Animorphs, we had six months and it was unforgiving. It was punishing because it was every month. And so we had no time. And at one point, we were writing 14 books a year because we were writing, well, shit, that's just on Animorphs. We were writing other stuff simultaneously. So it was a lot of production. And we were rather stressed for time. And uh, right around book 11, we'd had our first kid. And uh, she was just you know, an enormous pain in the ass. As uh, children tend to be, she showed up premature. And it was just you know, a whole thing. So we were kind of uh, you know, stressed and burned out and not good at editing. So... I was, you know, I ended up doing most of the editing, by which I mean, I would look at it and go, yeah, that's good, that's good, that's good, now fuck everything else. <laughs> and I would just throw out 50 pages. Now, that's not the way you're supposed to do it. You know, you don't treat a writer that way. It's, it's not good. You should send the manuscript back to the writer with notes and we give them another chance to fix it and they send it to you. And then maybe you, you step in and do something. Well, with, with six months and no time, that wasn't happening. So we had to, uh, so I was, I was brutal and i think all the those writers ended up hating us as a result um you know which is, is completely understandable but we were kind of in a position of not having any choice so as we went along i think the first almost all of them we wrote uh, well we wrote the outlines for all of them and we edited maybe the first 10 of the ghosted things and then we hit upon the brilliant idea which we thought was such an innovation our uh editor throughout animals was tanya alicia martin uh worked for scholastic who we just you know She's the fifth beetle of the uh, Animorphs universe. Sure. Um, so at one point we were just like, how can we hire somebody to do the editing more properly and get this ready for Tanya? And then it occurred to us, oh, let's hire Tanya. So at one point, Tanya was working simultaneously for us and for Scholastic and basically doing everything. You know, we would like say, here's some ideas. Let's jot those down, send it off. And then, you know, and again, we, we paid Tanya well, but it was, a, it was a hell of a racket, frankly. I mean, we were basically, you know, clearing 80 grand per book per month, not setting aside royalties. This is the upfront money, 80 grand a book and spending 20 to get 95% of the work done. So we felt like that was uh, kind of a, you know, kind of a scam and I didn't feel great about it, but you know, it was kind of what we had to do to make the machine continue to run. And then we reached the end and we're like, okay, we're all out of ideas. Um, we, we got other, we have to move on. We've beaten this thing to death. So we had written all the long forms ourselves, all the Megamorphs and all the Chronicles. We wrote the first 24 ourselves. Um, and some others in there were essentially, which I'm not going to identify and couldn't remember anyway, but essentially we wrote, you know, it's, it's the point where, we weren't able to use a lot of what the ghosts did. I, I remember one, I, it's a hundred page, it's 140 page manuscript. I, I kept 40 <laughs> and did wow. the other hundred. So it was, uh, you know, and it was unfair to them. And I apologize belatedly to all those people, but it was, you know, we had a lot going on. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the ghostwriting process. It's, okay. it's not, you know, it's, it's not a great, it's a great training ground. I mean, that's, that's what we took away from it because what we learned from writing Sweet Valley and from writing um, Girl Talk and from doing a shit for Disney, and we did uh, mermaid books and uh, Aladdin books and a haunted house book and a pirates, but you know, this kind of stuff. 
I mean, that, that taught us our business. I mean, that taught us our job. And we got good, we got disciplined, we got fast. And because we were, try- we were trying to live entirely off writing, we didn't have jobs at this point. Um, we had to be fast in order, because we were so low paid. So because we were making so little money per book, we had to learn to crank out enormous amounts of stuff to the point where there's one uh, Disney catalog where, you know, the catalog where they put out, here's the books coming up in the next season. They had to ask us to use two other pseudonyms because otherwise it would look like Catherine Applegate had written everything Disney put out that year, sure. including a Mickey Mouse uh, craft thing for Christmas, which is just what the fuck two of us are doing that for. I can't imagine. But you know, you, you get paid. So it was all, uh, you know, we're trying to make a living and it was, it was desperate times. And, and uh, we had been really seriously poor uh, for a long time. And I'd been seriously poor even longer because um, Catherine is much more middle class than I am. Um, so, yeah, that was that was the whole ghosting. But, but we learned the, we learned the job, you know, mm-hmm. we learned how to learn how to do it. And so it was one of those, you know, like an apprenticeship. OK. Interesting. Yeah. I wasn't, I wasn't sure how like involved you two were with the process, but it sounds like you were d- decently involved. We were, we were very involved in the first, I don't remember the exact number, but I think there was something like 23 ghosted books, give or take of that. I just from memory, I think about the first half we were heavily controlled uh, and the second half we did not do much. Gotcha. Give or take. Sure. Nice. Do you have any uh, memories of working with a ghostwriter that you particularly hated working with? <laughs> no, we didn't. We didn't hate. I never hated working with any of them. And it was all, you know, it was all done by email. It's all been done by remote. I mean, we'd met uh, two of the people we'd met. Uh, Ellen Giroux, who was one of the best, uh, had worked for us, being, as I like to think of it, the, the cookie person. Because when uh, Clara, who was then Jake, but when uh, she was born uh, premature, the first two months were, you know, fairly hellish. Uh, we were in the NICU for a while and then we were home and she had a monitor on that would go off, you know, at random times during the day and night. So we had no sleep or anything. So we'd hired Ellen basically because we were immobile. We couldn't move. I had Clara like glued to my shoulder anytime I, you know, it was my turn and then it was Catherine's and back and forth. So we hired Ellen and uh, Ellen's just like smart as hell. I mean, she's just like, you know, way better than we ever deserved. So she was the one person we really knew. And I think she did two books for us um, and also ran for a while this little charity we do in uh, in Minneapolis uh, called Creature Comfort, which is kind of an off the books charity. But we basically, uh, there's like 20 people or something. And they're mostly, you know, people with serious uh, physical problems uh, usually. And uh, we pay for their comfort animal. We pay for their pet. That's it, you know pay the vet bills, give them enough for dog food and shit. So she ran that for a while and did that really well. And she's just, you know, a smart person, but she was the only one we kind of, you know, knew uh, out of real life. Everybody else, I honest to God, don't remember how we got them. It was before social media, so it wasn't that way. Well, that's awesome though. That's an awesome yeah. sounding charity and everything. That's great. Yeah, it's been going for, well, since, uh, I don't know, like, 20 years or something like that since uh basically since the end of animorphs and so was, again your animorphs money at work <laughs> and thank you thank you thank your parents too i i will they were the ones uh bankrolling that <laughs> that was cool okay next what do you got um hmm, let's see so i think you mentioned somewhere before that you would have handled the auxiliary animorphs differently. Um, have you, yeah. you thought about what exactly would have, you would have done for that? Well, I would have made them more real characters. It would have made them, you know, a, a more fleshed out thing. We weren't thrilled with, you know, it was kind of an idea we had and we started and then it was handed off. You know, it was the ghost who ran it. Um, and by the time we came back in, you know, decisions had been made, things had been done and we had not been that involved, quite frankly. And so I think, So to be honest with you, I'm not entirely sure how it was handled because my memory doesn't extend quite that far. Um, But we just know that I I think we would do more, we would do much more nuanced, um, uh, more relevant kind of thing. And in the end, they kind of almost end up being dismissed at the end in in the last two books, which we did write, um, because we kind of didn't know what to do with them. And we hadn't really developed them 
and didn't, you know, so we more or less eliminated them, which was, you know, it's, you, you do things when you're writing, you know, books that are ridiculously fast rate that you might not do if you, if you had time to sit back and consider. So, you know, Animorphs books weren't produced over the course of a year. They were produced over the course of three weeks and at 140 pages, 150 pages. And, you know, and we of course had no time for rewrites either. So what, what we wrote, that was it. There was, there was copy editing, which they just made their own decisions. I don't, I'm sure at some point something got sent back to us and went, what do you think? Can you do something with this? But there was almost no editorial feedback because we were basically running a, you know, a, a two person assembly line mm -hmm. and just cranking shit out. And we've got you know, 20 days to write uh, 140 pages. You know, that's, that's a fairly high rate of speed. Uh, that you have to keep up yeah. and again we're always doing other stuff at the same time so yeah it's just you know it, you accumulate regrets in your in your writing stuff you look back and go um you know i i probably didn't do that right or Catherine probably didn't do that right you know we should have given should have been more aware should have been more sensitive should have been and it's not even a question of sensitive it's just a question of you know if we had developed these characters ourselves we would have cared about them you know, they would have been family at that mm -hmm. point. At, at some level, they would have been our employees. We would have known them. We would have known how to use, you know, how to use them in the story. Mm -hmm. And so we just didn't. So, yeah, there you go. And the same with uh, with gay representation, mm -hmm. which we flirted with the idea. And there's that one book where we do have a, the exiled Andalite couple who are uh, clearly, uh, well, but see, not clearly, not clearly to a, to a 12, a 10 year old or a nine year old. Yeah, there's like um, subtext, but yeah. It was, it was sub, yeah, but it was subtext. And if we had it to do over again, would we do it? Yes, we would. Mm -hmm. If we had it to do over again, we would do it differently. But, um, you know, we did what we thought we could get away with at, at a particular sure. time. And we also knew we were getting away with murder with Animorphs anyway. I mean, <laughs> Jesus Christ. I mean, some of the stuff, <laughs> was, uh, I'll talk to fans and they'll remind me of some stuff we wrote. I'm like, God damn, really? <laughs> and what, nine-year-olds are reading that? Jesus. Uh, so you know it's just again uh, it always kind of it's always kind of um unsettling to both of us when when people treat uh, when people use like a word like canon for animals as though we were chiseling this thing in stone and it was just you know two desperate idiots trying to keep up the entire time it was no uh this is not a great philosophical treatise but I'll tell you something, the coolest letter we ever got was from, um, and we didn't hear from fans before we were doing it, we heard from years and years later, it was from some kid writing that uh, uh, he'd gone to his first college philosophy class, looked through the syllabus and realized he'd already covered it all in Animorphs. They're like, yeah, <laughs> because, because there was a lot of, Animorphs is a lot, there was a, it was an iceberg, there was a lot under the surface, there was a lot of, I think, subtext. It just whatever interested us at the time, questions we had, you know, things we didn't understand, things we wanted to explore, you know, that's what you do. Yeah, the thing that blows my mind is Alex grew up reading the series and I just started reading them a couple of years ago when we started the podcast and I'm just kind of going through it and I'm like, how much would this have changed me if I had read this as a kid? Like, well, we were always worried about that, of course. Um, you know, changing people <laughs> were like waiting for the first school shooting where, you know, it's like, I'm Jake, you know, kind of thing. Oh, no. Christ, no, please God. <laughs> um, we weren't sure what we were doing, but, um, you, you know, neither of us had uh, exactly a degree in child psychology or, you know, and neither of us knew anything about anything. Um, we didn't know what a reading level was, for example. I think uh, it was years later, we're like, hey, what's that? Oh, look, it's, it's a thing. So it's like certain words you're supposed to use and others. Oh, okay, cool. And we'd only written like a hundred books by that point. And, and then discovered it. So, you know, we were just bumbling our way along, um, trying to figure out what we were doing on a, on a daily basis. And um, surprised, I think, that it was, it was a success. We thought Animorphs, when we first submitted it, we thought we, we were doing two things at the beginning. We had Animorphs and we had Barfarama. Barfarama is exactly what it sounds like. <laughs> Barfarama is, an editor said, we're thinking about doing some grossed out books and we said, yeah, okay. Um, and Catherine basically said, yeah, Michael will do that. Um, <laughs> so we were doing, uh, we were doing Barfarama and Animals. Barfarama we thought was gonna be a hit because we had underestimated the audience, which is an, an interesting thing. 
we thought the audience out there, the readership was a little bit dumber, you know, that they would just go for the gross. And it was, you know, it was good gross. It was as good as we could make it. And as fucking disgusting as you can imagine. <laughs> it was just, just horrible. Uh, and it, we had fun inventing terms like diaper gravy, you know, that kind of stuff. We, we <laughs> nice. amused ourselves. We had a rating system for the intensity of vomit, you know, the Barfacane rating system. Uh, so it'd be like a force five or, or whatever. So it was, just, it was great. You know, it's like the kind of thing you wanted to get stoned and work on. Um, <laughs> it was that. So we thought now Barfarm was going to be a hit, but Animorphs is too niche because Animorphs, by the end of first book, we were looking at it going, did we just like imprison a kid in the body of a hawk? What the hell are we doing here? You know, and then it was just all downhill from there. And um, we thought this is too smart, too weird. And we'd actually gone into this. We'd analyzed Goosebumps. And, and we never, almost never read kids' books. Um, this is ignorance is the best way to proceed. Uh, but we'd analyzed the appeal of Goosebumps, so we, we'd seen what he did. And we love Arl Stein; he's a, he's a sweet guy. But and we, but we figured out, okay, it's this and this, and it delivers a a one or two emotion. It, it doesn't confuse you. It's simple. It's straightforward. Because jump scares, uh, the level is set, so you know it's not going to be. We're not going to be uh, putting needles in people's eyeballs. Or something, you know, you know, you know, understand what I'm saying. So yeah. we thought, here's what we want to do. We want to create something that's kind of in this zone, not too big, gives a single emotional punch, uh, not a very complex story. And then, like a week later, we're like, oh, this is totally not that, is it? Uh, <laughs> 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 we actually had we'd written the series Bible, and then we wrote the first book. And we're like, oh my god, this is this is not at all what we uh, what we were planning to do. Oops. And it ended up just being this incredibly you know obviously complicated layered kind of thing and we thought well this is never gonna work or if it is it'll be a niche and of course we we're dead wrong it was barfarama that was a niche and it was only popular we later learned it sold only well in uh, college bookstores <laughs> yeah yeah we, awesome. we figured that out too uh, so you know <laughs> freshmen getting high and reading barfarama aloud to each other i think was was the whole audience for that oh, uh, man. but but okay um, so we were very pleasantly surprised that Animorphs worked at all. And then, of course, no idea that it was going to walk for 63 books because I think the first contract was for, must have been six, I think, six books. And then, and you, you don't sit there and think, well, let's, you know, here's what we'll do. We'll do let's parse this out because we're probably going to end up at like 10 times as much. So you throw it all in and do what you can and, and, and make everything up from, from that point forward. But yeah, we were surprised by the success. And we were also surprised by the endurance that it's still a thing uh, with a lot of people. Because at the time, we were too busy to deal with, with fan mail. I mean, we weren't at Bob Stein's level of fan mail, but there was a lot. So Scholastic dealt with it. So we had no choice. We don't have staff. You know, it's just the two of us. Yeah. Um, so we, didn't, we had almost no contact with fans. This is all pre-social pre, uh, media. So when social media became a thing and people started reaching out to us and the internet got our address out there so people could send our address and you know, send us snail mail and we started getting these letters and i remember one it was typed single space narrow margins all around two sides four pages all together on what animorphs had meant to this person and you know we're um the rule number one for us is don't start taking yourself seriously you know don't don't buy your own bullshit and the fact that a grown person, this is this wasn't a child, this is a grown person, this kid in, in college or whatever, was having that much, was talking about this stupid thing we'd done, you know, having that much of an impact. It was just, it was, you know, it's such a cliche word and we've tried to find a better one, but it's humbling. You know, you, you would think you'd get all puffed up and go, huh, look at me. But instead you're like, um, oh, it's I, we accidentally made something bigger than we thought we were making. It became a thing. And it had an actual effect on actual real people. And it wasn't just, you know, something they put in the rear view mirror and forgot uh, as people with tattoos, people who named their kids after characters. Um, and it's just, by the way, the, the sweetest, most decent bunch of fans you could ever, ever hope for uh, as, a, as a writer. Um, I mean, there's all kinds of fandoms that get kind of toxic. And boy, Animorphs has just been just, I mean, there's one or two weird outliers. But 99.9% .9 of Animorphs people we've ever dealt with are, they're always smart. I've never met a stupid Animorphs fan. 
for a start. They're always smart. They're always, they always give a fuck. You know, they're always, they're always motivated, interesting people. Um, so we're very proud of that and, and very, um, and like I say, humbled. Like we, it's not something we, we didn't set out to build that, you know, it just happened. And it happened because of you guys, not because of us. So. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with that. Too. And we talked to um, Chris Grine a little bit as well. And luckily uh, nobody's been too mean to him either. <laughs> He's like, you guys no, are really nice. <laughs> we have been so relieved. We checked the Amazon uh, reviews and the good and mm-hmm. Goodreads reviews for his stuff. Because we're like, oh, Christ, you know, you never know. Because it's like, you know, Star Wars fans, God forbid, you know, you put a, yeah. an eyebrow out of place on a character. There's, you know, suddenly, yeah, there's 15 YouTubes denouncing you, uh, <laughs> attacking <laughs> everything you've ever done, threatening to murder your children. You know, it's just, yeah. but uh, so we're like, oh, Christ, you better buckle up, Chris. You never know what the hell's coming. No, just nothing. First of all, they sold well. And let me just emphasize, this is 100% Chris's work. We have not a single we wrote the books we have not a single thing to do with this this is a hundred percent chris um we're just stealing a bunch of the money that's it that's, that's <laughs> the our, way to do it though that's our deal <laughs> for us. but now he's been he's been great i mean he's he's outstanding mm-hmm. um we're we're very pleased with the work the work he's doing uh very pleased with the guy i mean we've talked to him a couple of times he's just you know like nice normal yeah normal human being all right um, we understand if you can't or don't want to say anything about it, but mm-hmm. what's going on with the movie when you well I'll that? give you the whole I'll give you the whole story here. So uh, we have no rights contractually for animals because we have a very bad agent. <clears throat> we'll hunt her down and kill her later. Um, <laughs> what were we talking about? I'm sorry, diver. The movie. Oh, the movie. <laughs> So uh, no contractual rights whatsoever. And then uh, the, the, but the producer, Eric Feig, uh, reached out to us and said, basically, we'd like to make you guys executive producers, pay us some money, um, and get your input. So uh, Catherine, being uh, even more antisocial than I am, said, yeah, Michael's going to do that part. So um, I started uh, dealing with him. And I told him early on, I said, look, the only important decisions in this are the decisions that are made early on. It's, it's the beginning decisions. Let's talk about the time frame. Let's talk about if it's current, are we gonna, how are we going to deal with social media? How are we going to deal with the presence of cell phones? How does that change the plot? Is, are we going to make it more of a nostalgia play? All that kind of stuff. Who are we going to, and the big one, who are we going to hire to write the screenplay? And I had a guy on the side uh, who uh, reached out to me on something else. He wants to, he's a producer and a writer and he sent some great stuff. There's this movie called Run, R-U-N, watch that movie made for like a, I don't know, a dollar 50. And it's just, it's just, out, just, you know, enjoy it. It's just, it's one of those small, very tense kind of, you know, uh, very intense movies. And he's done a lot of other stuff as well. He's, so he's kind of, he's a semi big deal. Um, and he's, we started talking about Everworld because he was trying to acquire the rights to Everworld. Um, and then we got off on Animorphs, of course. And he's, he's not just a fan. He's, he's a super fan. He's one of those guys, you know, in book 24, when you did this, you know, that kind of, like, I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about anymore. Um, but so he's, he's like the super end of this thing. And he was up for the job. And we were kind of secretly pushing for him, but not so secretly. Going, look, he already is right in. He knows everything. We've heard his pitch. He's got it right. Let's go there. So we finally get on the call with the producers, uh, with uh, Eric and the entire panoply of people um, on a Zoom call. And uh, well, we've narrowed the list down to three people of writers. Like, great. So we're already down to just three. In other words, we've had no input at all up to this point. We've been consulted on no decisions. And I'm starting to hear the decisions that you've made. I, I hear that you've already decided on this and that and the other thing. So, uh, and now you've got the list of writers down to three. Okay, tell me about the writers. Well, one, we don't like at all. Oh, okay, so it's really two. And the other one is the guy that Catherine and I like. But he's excluded because they don't like his pitch somehow. And because they don't really know anything about the books. They have, whereas he did. Um, so he understood kind of where the story had to go and uh, what the characters were. So they said, well, but we, we're, not, we're not that thrilled with him either. So, so, I go, so we're really down to one person. We're down to one person. You've made the decision. They go, yeah. 
and she's uh, a TV writer. Uh, so it's not like some Bigfoot came in and went, you know, it's not like Aaron Sorkin said, I'd like to write it, at which point you go, fine, dude, <laughs> yeah. go for it. Um, but so, and she's a TV writer and I, I'm not going to give you her name, but I'll say that she's written some good stuff, <laughs> stuff you would like, stuff I like, but not stuff that's really particularly relevant to this. Um, and then I said, okay, fine. So I'll just eat this shit for now. Um, and then, uh, but I want to talk to her. I want to talk to the writer. So set up a Zoom call. It is okay, but you're going to have to have one of us sit in on it. I go, what? And at that point, it just struck me. Why the hell am I even listening to this? And yet it became this big thing. The captain's agent was involved in the whole thing. This big Magilla's whole uh, controversy over whether or not I could spend you know, an hour on a Zoom call with a woman who was going to adapt something that both of us cared a great deal about and created without being, without having a suit in the room, you know, without having a, a third party in the room, because I said, I just want to talk to her as a writer, you know, because we'll talk, you know, because we know what we're talking about. You know, we, we all speak that same, the same language. So just, I just want to talk to her. I'm not going to yell at her. I'm not going to do anything. It's a Zoom call for fuck's sake. Yeah. Um, and they were, no, no, you got to have uh, me or somebody else in, in, on the call with you. So at that point, I said, yeah, you know what? Um, take your, your title and everything else and shove them because you, I'm not interested in an empty title. You know, we don't want to be executive producers and then people go, well, what would you do? We'll go, fuck all. So th at that point, we're just being hired to shill. You know, we're being hired to handle you guys, in other words. Uh, and I wasn't willing to do that. Catherine wasn't willing to do that. And we're kind of like, no, we're just, we can't be involved at that level. If, if we don't have any input even in anything important, then we're not going to sit there and automatically endorse the final product. That's not, the, we're not going to play that game. So um, we passed up what's, I guess, the, like the annual salary of a couple of normal hardworking people um, and the titles and then uh, more phone calls and because uh, God knows these people love their meetings. Um, but uh, I finally talked to him. I said, look, I'm, I'm here anytime you want this writer to reach out to me. You don't have to pay me anything. You don't have to give me a title. Just because I care about the project, because I care about animals, you know, I'll talk to you. If, I, if it's something I don't want to handle on my own, I'll talk to Catherine about it. Um, well, and let's just leave it at that. So that's how we left it. So my, I have no official involvement. Catherine has no official involvement. Uh, we won't have our names on the picture. And I'm not endorsing a, a damn thing until I see the final product. So, uh, that's yeah, and I want to say by some, that's specific to Animorphs and to Gone. Those are the two things mm -hmm. that, that well, Catherine has her own set separate set of stuff. Those are the two things where the fandom is large enough and devoted enough that I just I cannot let them get fucked over. You know, I can't let that happen like it did with that awful tv show made for nickelodeon and we tried to talk to him about that we told him don't do a live action animorphs show you don't have the budget for it it's going to look like shit do it animated if you're going to do it do it animated you know go to mm -hmm. warner brothers and talk to the guys doing the batman thing that was fucking beautiful like you could see animorphs in that context like the the batman i forget what they call it the very noir uh, comic book or uh, um, uh, animated version of batman they did uh, back in the 90s it's oh, just yeah. it was just it was like the one of those take every frame and every frame's beautiful kind mm -hmm. of thing mm -hmm. um and we we love that and it's like go talk to those guys man you know see if see if they're interested no no let's make a piece of shit television show instead and then you can spend the next 20 years apologizing to fans uh who are exposed to it so uh, that's kind of what we don't want to do now plenty of other properties we own we go you know you want remnants sure take remnants do whatever you want with remnants not, not as invested there, but it's, it's about the fans at that point and about knowing that you guys have been uh, supportive and devoted uh, and like I said, bought the house, bought several houses now um, and, uh, and we're grateful for that and the least I think we owe Animorphs fans and Gone fans alike is to do whatever we can not to screw up something that they care about, right? And that we care about. So that's the movie thing. Wow. Although Gone looks like it's going a lot better than Animorphs right now. And that's another series that I've read uh, one of the books of, but I haven't delved into too deeply yet. It's, um, 
Yeah, that's the other. So I wrote that in uh, 2007 after we had, uh, for the excellent reason that we'd run out of money. Um, we quit right after Animorphs Everold Remnants after that period. Um, we both just, that's it, we're done. And we'd written, I don't know, 120 books or 130 books by that point. It's just ridiculous. And, and you know, so at kind of an insane pace. So we were like, okay, I'm going to do something else. So um, for a while, I worked with a guy who was doing documentaries just because why not? It was a guy I knew, gave me, got a trip to Spain out of it. Um, and then uh, I did political media for a while. Uh, I had this idea for how we could create reprogrammable political ads. Um, and this is at a time where that was like a novel concept, apparently. Um, so I came up with some templates and uh, put on my big boy clothes and went to Washington and met with various people, uh, political types. And the Democratic Legislative Campaign Committee, which handles like state races, you know, like state house, state senate, uh, basically said, sure. So we did that for like a year, I guess two cycles. But I pretty quickly realized that um, if I were going to stick with this, it was going to be going to a very large number of meetings and cocktail parties with really boring people. Um, and I just looked at that. I looked that lifestyle square in the eye. I said, yes, I'm not going to do that. Um, and then uh, we were in North Carolina by this point, And uh, I'd started to, I'd started thinking I'd better just get back to work because, you know, we, we continue to spend like drunken sailors. So um, I was sitting there in the room with Catherine and I pitched her this idea, basically like a quick version. It's this and this and this. And she immediately said, stop everything else you're doing and write that. So, you know, I'm a good, obedient husband um, and I do what I'm told. So I did that. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> so are you kind of like a military buff about like into that media at least? A little bit, yeah. I mean, uh, are you referring to front lines? Yeah, okay. I just finished the first book and I'm into the second book there, which has been awesome. I've been I really enjoyed that. I think it's the best thing I've ever written. Um, and it was certainly the one I put the most uh, work into. If nothing else, in figuring out how to write it. Because mm -hmm. I went back and forth. Um, you know, often when I start a book, I know exact, I know right away what voice I'm going to use. Like gone, I knew I knew it was gonna be third person. I knew I'd sell more if it was first person, like Animorphs was. I know mm -hmm. that's easier for YA audiences, but I didn't want to write that kind of story. I wanted to write a Stephen King kind of story. You know, lots of plot threads going forward at the same time, and allowing me to cherry pick between between plot threads for whatever scene I would, would be most interesting to. Um, and then, uh, so but with front lines, I didn't know. If, I knew I wanted three main characters. I, I already had that kind of idea. Uh, I knew it was going to be a, a white girl from Northern California because I was living in Northern California. And it's her, she's, her hometown is clearly based on Hillsburg, California. Um, and I don't know why I gave it a fake name. I just, just one of those things. Um, I forget what I called it now. Um, and another one, I knew I wanted the Jewish girl uh, because most Americans at that time, historically, had no fucking I had clue what was going on with the Nazis. Whereas a Jewish girl from New York would. So I knew I wanted a Jewish girl. And I wanted a black girl. And I knew that that was going to be a problem. Because in reality, the um, combat use of black troops came much later in the war. Um, and that wasn't convenient for me. So I made one big change, which is this uh, fictitious Supreme Court decision that allows uh, women to enlist and also to be drafted uh, and sent into combat. And uh, the other change, I mean, is slightly smaller which is I moved the combat involvement of black troops earlier in the game so that I could get this character into it. And I knew I wanted, uh, I knew I wanted one of them to be a medic. And uh, I was kind of basing Rio on uh, Audie Murphy. And there, Audie Murphy was a movie star in the 50s. And before that, he was the most decorated American soldier in World War II. And the cool thing about Audie Murphy was he was a scrawny little kid from Texas, from fuck all Texas. Um, and he tried to enlist repeatedly, tried, went to the Marines. And they basically told him, dude, you're, you're, you're a tiny little guy and you're, you're kind of, uh, you're kind of effeminate, quite frankly. Uh, so no. And he tried the Navy and they told him essentially the same thing. He finally went to the army and he looks like everybody's 12 year old brother at this point. You know, he's, he's like a child. I mean, in, you know, to look at, obviously it's a man, but he's, and so 
even while he's in the army serving in Italy, his, um, his superiors are trying because they like the guy to keep him away from combat, but they can't because he's, yeah. And so he ends up with like every medal you can get, you know, the medal of honor, France decorated him, Italy decorates him. I mean, just like, you know, everywhere. And then later in life, unfortunately suffered from a uh, fairly serious PTSD while nevertheless denying that such a thing existed. So he was, a, it was an interesting character to me to kind of base it on. And I thought, you know, if Audie Murphy can go become this great decorated warrior, don't tell me that a woman of the same size can't. So that's, that's real. And she's probably physically a little bigger than Audie Murphy was. So I wanted one hardcore, I'm in this for the fight kind of person. You know, I, I didn't want to fight, but God damn it, here I am. You know, kind of gung-ho kind of, uh, and capable. So hence real. And um, then I needed, I needed somebody in intelligence because sometimes in this way I wanted to widen scope. So a combat soldier only knows what that combat soldier is doing, right? I'm fighting, I'm in this trench, I'm in this hole, I'm shooting that guy. No concern about anything beyond that. Um, the medic, on the other hand, has a very different perspective, obviously, because she's not directly involved. She's not part of the killing action. She's part of the getting people well enough so that they can get back to killing action. So it's a very, it's a very different thing, but also, also they're just like the bravest. Yeah. It's, it, it's uh, you know, what, what those guys do. They run out in the middle of a fucking firefight. It's just, it's, I find it emotionally moving. And I always did. I think those guys are just, you know, they're kind of amazing. So I wanted one person to do that. And I, and, uh, I thought, well, I got these three. But then it was still back and forth. Am I going to jump first person, first person, first person? Am I going to go past tense, present tense? I decided on present tense, which I'd never written before. And it irritates the fuck out of a lot of people because I wanted to kind of scrape the sepia tone off of it and make it seem more immediate. So mm -hmm. I wrote it first person, which generally is me meant writing, uh, not, I'm sorry, um, present tense, writing present tense, present tense, present tense, past tense, past tense, past tense. Oh, fuck. Back up. <laughs> present tense, present tense, all the way through the book. I wrote the first 200 pages out, I think, three different ways. And it kept throwing it out and then finally hit on what I liked. And I used the, the framing device of the other character. Or the fourth character uh, who's doing the, the framing device because again I wanted to be able to stretch the, the frame a little bit sometimes so yeah that was that took a lot of work plus I did a fuck ton of research I mean I, mm -hmm. I haven't been caught on any important fact yet because I did a lot I read a lot of books and watched a lot of videos and uh, went to places um, so I went to um, you know I've been all over the various places in Italy and Sicily and France I couldn't get to North Africa, which bummed me out. Um, but it was right that, at that particular point. It was like, um, absolutely go there if you'd like to be kidnapped. Um, that's your destination. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. Let's let's not do that. Um, <laughs> let's not go to the Al Qaeda infested mountains. Let's uh, let's just look at it on Google Maps and see what we can make out of it. Um, but yeah, I, I dug. I, I loved writing that. It didn't sell for shit, unfortunately. Um, and uh, but you know that sometimes it works financially and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, that's uh, such a bummer. It's such a good book. I'll do my best to to get the ten people I know to buy it. So the guerrilla <laughs> marketing. I'd appreciate, I'd appreciate that. The, uh, yeah, and I felt please. I I thought I wrapped it well. Uh, we were always unsure about how we wrapped um, uh, animals, and we didn't wrap Everworld. Uh, we we ghosted out by that point. We were we were. Just destroyed we were beat um and we didn't uh finish remnants we wrote the first four books of remnants and ghosted the rest and very little involvement at that point to be honest we have no idea what's in those books really um but we, so we knew we, we knew how we wanted to wrap animals and then we're like ah oh, fuck people really hate that aren't they um no we said yeah fuck it we gotta do it it's a war story war story is gonna end like a war story does so um, Rachel, for example, was based quite consciously on um, this movie called The War Lover. Uh, Steve McQueen pay, plays a bomber pilot and Robert Wagner's the young firebrand. Um, and Steve McQueen's the old war horse who falls in love basically with war. And so we wanted to do that with Rachel, have somebody kind of go too far, get too far into it, uh, become defined by it, and then have no other place to go. And we knew that Jake at the end of it uh, something similar. We wanted to have 
Uh, he's not as traumatized, perhaps, but he's also effectively useless because here's a kid who, at this point, is 16 or whatever. You know, he's he's Eisenhower. <laughs> you know, he's he's Patton. Uh, now what? He gets a job at uh, at uh, Chick Fil A. You know, what do you do with your life? Yeah. So we wanted to talk about that, and it's not just because of youth, but a lot of guys who've been in combat come back and have that same experience. Um, this sudden loss of belonging to a group is often a lot of people think that's to do uh that's a great cause of ptsd that it isn't the combat per se that it's the sudden loss of a group and one day you're fighting for your life with 40 other guys in the mountains of afghanistan or wherever and two weeks later you're wearing an orange vest in fucking home depot you know how do you so that was you know how do you deal with that um and then cassie we knew cassie was probably going to be okay um you know cassie was always kind of okay and at times I've heard her uh, I, you know, called a hypocrite, and, and she was, you know, to a certain extent. But she was all, you know, you can be a moral voice without being a perfect moral voice. And Cassie was the moral voice inside Anne West, occasionally pausing, going, I don't know, should we commit mass murder? I'm just, just asking. <laughs> um, should we? So, um, and uh, Marco, we knew, would profit from the whole thing. And there's no question about that. Marco's oh, yeah. a survivor. Uh, and he would find a way to, to be fine with it. Axe would go back to the Andalites, and Tobias would never be okay. Because, you know, first of all, he's a hawk, and second of all, he lost the love of his life, and it's extremely unlikely he's going to find another girl, if you know what I mean. So um, we knew, we, we kind of knew the dynamic of all that, and we also knew that was an unhappy ending, but at the same time, we didn't want an ending where it was like the first Star Wars, or a Star Trek, for early Star Trek movies. The part where assemble all the characters, play the fanfare, ap apply medals, you know, kind yeah. of shit. Yay, it's all happy. Uh, wasn't an entire planet destroyed yesterday? Yeah, but we're past that now. We're having a happy time. You know, we wanted to be more realistic about it and to treat each of the individual characters in a way that would be appropriate uh, and show aspects of how you survive a war. Sometimes people are fine. My dad went to war. He was uh, did two tours in Vietnam. Um, There's it times he's, you know... He's not happy about everything he did um, or that he saw. And he wasn't, wasn't much in combat. He, he ran boats on the Mekong. Um, but he came out of it okay. You know, he's, he went on, had work, and was productive. He's still alive. He lives down near San Diego. Um, starting to lose it a little bit. But then uh, so am I. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, we knew people would hate that. So then we wrote this kind of snarky letter. You know, the, the basically the, uh, hey, you didn't like it? Fuck you. Uh, <laughs> yep. I think that's the TLDR of, of that letter. You don't like it? Fuck you. Um, no, I don't think that's, I'm sorry. It's not quite, it's not quite how we intended it. Uh, no, but, no, but I were, love that. <laughs> I love that about it, honestly. We actually thought at the time, people are going to hate it now, 10 years from now, I bet they like it. But if people are still reading Animorphs, if they remember it, if they remember back, they go, oh, okay, that was, that actually had a meaning. That was, there was a point to that. Uh, and then in the end, uh, Jake has no life but to find another war to fight. Yeah, that's, that's what he does. But so that's what some types of soldiers end up having to do. So that's why you get guys who've gone back to Afghanistan four or five times. You know, they're not they're not being forced to in many cases. They're volunteering. All right. Um, yeah. Uh, the first one here is just which of your works are you most proud of out of everything that you've written? Oh, probably. Well. From my perspective, I'm a, I'm a working man. Uh, I didn't grow up, you know, in, in luxury, shall we say. Uh, I grew up in trailer parks. You know, I learned to swim in a bayou uh, a floated human excrement pass. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where I come from. And when I was 16, I quit high school. I dropped out of high school. Uh, actually, I was 15, I guess. Dropped out of high school uh, after having done one day of 11th grade. <clears throat> Plenty. Didn't really need to know the rest of that shit. Um, and went to work. And boy, that was that was a revelation. And I loved it. Uh, I got a job at Toys R Us. I had to fa get fake ID by signing up for the draft. Uh, during Vietnam, by the way. Because that's how smart I am. Uh, but I got fake ID so I could work at Toys R Us. And uh, I was a stock clerk. I wore a red and white striped tablier kind of thing. Smock. And I used to swing from the rafters, throwing boxes down. And my particular uh, gig was the doll aisle. I was a doll aisle guy. So I had uh, baby go bye-bye and cabbage patch. 
were like my people. Um, and then I got uh, a semi-promotion uh, to the Barbie aisle. That was exciting. So being a, a 15 year old, I occasionally would uh, amuse myself by improving the anatomical accuracy of Barbie and Ken dolls uh, with Sharpies because children have a right to know um, or, or something like that. Uh, you know, because they weren't paying me anything. It was like $1.60 an hour. So I did that for three months and took myself and this girl named Connie, who was a cashier to Europe uh, for three months, which is great. But the upshot of that was I loved work and I still do. I mean, it's, it's the only thing that made any sense. My God knows my family never did. Uh, the world didn't. And school, you know, it's great for most people, I'm sure. It wasn't great for me. So uh, I felt like I was wasting my time in school. So I was really happy to be out of school. Didn't make any sense. Uh, and work did so I look at everything from that point of view so from my point of view front lines because it was hardest for me to write so I value things in terms of how hard they are for me to accomplish how hard was that job uh, and next obviously animals just because it's you know it's fucking animals uh, and gone uh, more or less equal well animals has split custody so to speak with Catherine and gone's just mine um, so yeah those are those are the top three and some other stuff I've written uh, or that we've written together were kind of like, eh, okay, you know, fine. <laughs> it was fine. <laughs> and there's stuff I'm, I'm really proud of, um, like Berserk, because that was a hard write. That was a, it was a complicated write. And it was, um, it was mostly complicated. It was an intellectual puzzle I had to solve. And the intellectual puzzle was, how can I basically show a video game with real life consequences? How can I, how can I do that? Uh, and how can I use a monster that isn't bigger than every other monster, but smaller than every other monster? So I was, I was playing, I was asking myself those two questions, and I came up with the answer and uh, wrote the trilogy and slightly re uh, failed to include any characters people like. <laughs> <laughs> My slightly detail. Over, slightly <laughs> overlooked that detail. But, you know. <laughs> Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> so it, didn't, it didn't sell well, but it was, uh, I, I thought, successful. Yeah. Insofar as it, it is what I intended it to be, I guess. Oh, that's funny. That's, I have that one on my bookshelf as well to read next. So <laughs> I've got a lot of like, to do. Let me know if you like any of the characters. Okay. Um, I, don't, I don't think I did. Uh, oh, but I had a, uh, I, I love the opening. I had a, uh, well, I shouldn't spoil it for you, but it's, uh, it's a trick opening, I should say. On, okay on and i love the uh i love the armstrong twins and i love the uh you'll see this if you read further into the series the uh the natural gas tanker i came up with some cool ideas but it was kind of an ideas rather than an emotion book you know so it's 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 a smart book but not necessarily a heartful book so i'm still excited to read it <laughs> All right. Um, what's the, what is something that you wish people would notice more often about your writing? You know, honestly, I'm more surprised that I don't take shit from my, uh, my pros. It, it's more what I'm, I'm glad they don't notice. I mean, uh, nobody's come up and said, can, can you write a fucking sentence longer than five words? Are you, are you able to do that? Um, or where did you learn punctuation? <laughs> well, I didn't. Uh, I just kind of use an M dash for everything. Um, so I have my own uh, odd style. Um, it's either uh, short sentences or a deliberately long run on sentences. But mm -hmm. the deliberate little, but, but I have my purposes for those. Um, I want to I want to play with your perception of time as a reader. So if it, sometimes in a long run on sentence, I want you to be breathless because something's happening in the action that I want you to be breathless. Other times I'll throw in a bunch of choppy short things to to make you kind of judder as you, as you go through the text. At least that's my theory of what I'm doing. Um, as for punctuation, yeah, God knows. Um, they, fortunately, there's copy, editor, there's copy editors and they come along and go, you know, yeah. shouldn't that be a, like a period? Okay. Nah. <laughs> job. Look, it's a sentence that's... with no verbs. It's a sentence with neither <laughs> verbs nor nouns. How'd you do that, Michael? <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Catherine's so Catherine is so much more the uh, the prose stylist. Um, I mean, she actually she agonizes over words. Um, I mean, there's a reason now. Left to our own devices, I write 500 page long books, and she writes, you know, like tiny little things. 
uh, barely noticeable little things like Ivan. Um, but yeah, she's much <laughs> more the uh, she's much more the poet than I am. Let's let's say. So, how did you two split up Animorphs? Yes, uh, every conceivable iteration you can think of. That's what we did. So sometimes it was here's a chapter, here's another chapter. Sometimes it was I'm bored. Could you write the next two chapters? <laughs> or and sometimes it was uh, you know it was mid scene. I'd go. Sometimes I would get to a scene. I, I would just go you know x x x fill in some shit here, you know x x x. And she would do the same. You know like x x x write some action, x x x <laughs> out. Or you know can you think of a joke? You know so we did all those different versions of it. Um, including turning it into uh, domestic discord at times. Um, it'd be like um, the equivalent of why didn't you empty the sink would be what the fuck am I supposed to do with that chapter? You know, what What am I doing after that? You kind of left it hanging there, didn't you? You know, so it was, it was, it was like that chaotic, inexplicable, put it that way. I love that. That's hilarious. Disorganized. Well, you know, war is messy. There you go. That's hard. <laughs> writing is hard. <laughs> yeah, writing is hard. War is messy. All of the above. <laughs> uh, Casey, you had a question about the expanse, which is something I know nothing mm. about. Oh yeah, you, you mentioned the expanse on Twitter recently, and yeah. I mean, I definitely get like animorphs type vibes from that. Um, and I was just wondering if there's any other like books or movies or media that you've consumed recently that you would that you like or would recommend yeah well let me just talk about uh the expanse for a minute. i mean obviously the thing people love about expanse is it accepts that science is a real thing mm -hmm. now honestly in my books i don't you know i, I regularly decide eh, fuck it uh, i'm gonna <laughs> hack the laws of physics and do it differently right. because that's the universe i want to live in uh, i want to do the story in. Uh, but i love their their attention to um to science uh, and I love the fact that atypically for a lot of science fiction, it's built around actual characters. Mm -hmm. You know, you know who these people are. You know who the good guys are. You know the bad guys. They all have a reason. They're all there. They're all they're doing something. They represent something. They they mean something in the story. They aren't just plugins. You know, they aren't just hi. I'm you know the the talking monkey or whatever yeah. uh, over here. They're they're genuine and and complicated in many cases. And uh, but and the nice thing is their their contradictions are all internal. So they they may be a conflict with themselves but they're always still in character which is an important self-discipline to apply to anything you're writing um the one thing you never do is uh you don't betray the character basically you don't have the character do something the character shouldn't do uh, ever doesn't matter how much you need it for the plot if if it's a conflict between the character and the plot draw out the plot go back and write something different write the character stick with the character um so I love them for that reason. And obviously, you know, the, just the, the visuals are all quite lovely and the concepts and the ideas are interesting. Um, this season, I feel like they're struggling a bit, to be honest with you, it's season five. And I think I know why. Um, there's a, you know, I'm sure you've heard there's an issue with one of the cast members. I had not um, heard that. I'm actually only uh, on season three right now, so. Uh, oh, sorry, it's uh, Cass. There's, a, there's an issue with Cass. The, uh, I forget, it's the, the Martian who's the pilot um i think it's a me too kind of thing going on so it's possible that they've been having to shoot it in, you know in in odd ways and thus if, if they're writing around that god bless them because that's that's some hard fucking work to have done uh, I, I don't know that that's what they're doing but it seems a little writing wise a little eh, you know okay. a little shaky but still great i mean let me put it this way you know it went from an a plus down to an a so you know still sure. excellent work uh what else am i i'll tell you what else what else I like? It isn't spec fiction. Well, it is kind of in a way, but it isn't. You know, Dickinson on um, on Apple, and I told you, you know, I'm work oriented, so I always admire people who can do shit that I can't do. Um, the woman who's written that, and I forget her name, who's written Dickinson, has managed to make a live action drama, drama comedy about poetry. And not just generally like, oh, she's staring off at the stars, but about the specific poems written by Emily Dickinson. And Emily Dickinson wrote like little short poems and she never published because, you know, uh, her dad was a bit of a sexist, apparently, uh, although a nice guy, despite that. Um, so she never really published. And uh, 
and they're taking her poems and they're starting the story and they're having, sometimes they have magic realist imagery. Mm -hmm. So they'll have Emily look off and there'll be the uh, uh, death will be riding by in a carriage mm -hmm. or she'll be having a conversation with death. Um, and the dialogue is interesting because they've, uh, they modernized. So you're not hearing them. Uh, it's not that it's, I mean, they're not referring to airplanes, obviously, but they're they're living within within the reality that they have, but speaking in uh, English of the common of, of the present day, more or less. And the music also, they'll you know like suddenly throw in you know some uh, you know hip hop or something in, in the background. So they're they're making it more relevant, more modern, uh, while nevertheless making it about the poetry. And at one point or another, you don't necessarily know this is coming. They'll flash the poetry across the screen in like golden scroll letters. And you'll see the poetry that this show is being based on. And then you'll have this moment of revelation. Like, oh my God, that's that's right. That's right. She wrote this thing about a poem. And it's just, and that you can have character continuity through all that. And you can have a sense of humor through all that. Uh, and that you can have uh, even little bits of history thrown in through all that. Because this is immediately before the Civil War. Um, and it's just fantastic. It's fantastic work. Um, another uh, TV writer I'm high on is uh, Lisa McGee, who wrote Dairy Girls. And again, it's a case of how the fuck did you do that? Because uh, episode one, I, I forget the actual number, but I swear to God, by the end of episode nine, one, you know at least a dozen characters perfectly. And it's like, how? How did you do that in, in less than an hour? How the hell did you do that? I mean, that's, that to me is it's amazing shit. Um, and I'm sorry, it's mostly like TV writers I've been looking at lately because I'm in Hollywood and I'm thinking that way. Yeah. Uh, Damon Lindelof, who I was not thrilled with with Lost, even though I stole Gone from Lost uh, <laughs> to some extent. Um, because, I, because all the way through Lost, people are going like, they were giving interviews. So, no, no, we've got it. We've got it. I'm just, no, you don't. No, you don't. This thing started coming apart by the end of the first season. I don't, I don't bullshit a bullshitter. You haven't planned this whole thing out. <laughs> but okay, fine. Whatever, whatever you want to say, guys. Um, but it was still, it was, by the way, first best pilot ever. Uh, pilot episode of anything ever was a pilot of, of Lost and great characters, great, all, you know, great except for the overall storyline, which was Frey. But then he did Watchmen. And oh my God, I thought that was brilliant. Uh, is it HBO or mm -hmm. no, one of those? It's one of yeah. the premium services, not the movie, God forbid, yeah, yeah. Uh, but the TV <laughs> show. And I just thought, I thought it was just, I thought it was brilliant. Um, and I love the fact they brought, um, uh, they brought Tulsa into it. Um, I included the, the Tulsa massacre as part of the backstory of one of the characters in front lines. Uh, cause I'd only heard about it then. And I didn't notice, I didn't see that anybody else had much, uh, at that point, but they got into it and they showed it and it was just horrifying. And it was just so beautifully produced and beautifully written and so smart, um, that I just, I admired the hell of it. There's a lot of things, there's a lot of crap. Um, somebody needs to explain to me the screenplay for uh, Wonder Woman 1984 and how the fuck that ever got made. Um, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't understand how the resolution is that incredibly beautiful Gal Gadot and her Wonder Woman outfit, who's gonna live forever, by the way, uh, just has to lecture everybody else to, hey, fuck off and stop having wishes. And that's the ending. Thank you very much. We're out of here. <laughs> what in the holy hell? And we're appropriating people's bodies now. I mean, my God, I wouldn't have done that. You know, 20 years ago, I would have thought I might have an explanation. I have to explain what I'm doing here. If I'm just stealing a man's body uh, and using it to have sex, you know, I'm just like, yeah. And no explanation. No, no, like, why? Uh, where's the guy whose body we just stole? Is he? <laughs> Is he dead? Is he, you know, is he somewhere else? What's what's going on? No, that no, no, no time for that. Just time for Wonder Woman to lecture everybody on that. You know that wish you had, that wish you wrongly made that your kid would not die of cancer. Well, you're gonna have to take that back because we can't all be like me. We can't all be Wonder Woman. It's just oh, just I was just astonished it got, got me. And then um, and on the the negative list, there's you know the reason I'm so paranoid about animals movie and so so determined to be in control of gone if that gets made is things like uh, artemis fowl which is just what the what the fuck people i couldn't get what, through yeah. that what yeah, the fuck were you doing? well they they gutted it yeah, yeah. they gutted it mm -hmm. they went in and said well we read the we read the cover copy and uh, there's there's five elements on the cover copy let's throw out two of them and keep three yeah i'm sure it'll be fine 
Um, and it, it's, it's, it was vandalism, you know, it was just, and I don't know if it's the writers or the producers or who's responsible for it, but oh my God, poor Ann Colfer must be just sitting there going, I, you know, I hope that, I hope he got a good paycheck out of it because that was, that was sad. It could have been multiple movies and it's not going to be now um, because they fucked it up. So there, there's my recommendations and my, and my counter recommendations. <laughs> I'm I'm uh, uncertain about list. Star Trek. I'm I'm, I was like trying to buy it again, and I was because uh, I was always much more a Trekkie than I was a Star Wars person. Because uh, Star Trek exists in the secular universe, and um, uh, Star Wars is much more of a you know um, quasi religious. I mean, it's the Force, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, and as bad and cheesy as Star Trek could be, sometimes I had hopes for it. Then it was kind of they keep being dashed, and then I'll go, oh, the first episode's good and uh, no now it's not <laughs> no, yeah it's not the first episode now of it's... a card was strong but then it yeah no it's yeah. but then after that it was like uh, i don't know let's take star trek the one optimistic view of the future we have and make it grim and dark and full of corruption why and i'm sitting here <laughs> thinking yeah right now it's so the programming is so wrong for it because right now we've just been through four years of trump and a year of sitting in our fucking houses waiting for covid to kill us and at the end of that, people are not thinking, I would rather like something really gritty and dark. Right. No, it's going to be like, you know, during the depression when they had big dance numbers. You now we're in the money, yeah. uh, you know, pennies from heaven and all that shit where we're, you kind of ignore the fact that we've just all been through something miserable. Let's have a good time. Or, you know, Doris Day movies in the fifties uh, after World War II. I mean, there was some, there was also cinema noir. There was all the, the detective stuff uh, in there that reflected more of what had come directly out of the war. But at the same time, the overwhelming counter was, you know, okay, we're done. You know, we're done being unhappy. We're done with the stress. Yeah. Let's have something that's not so stressful. And at the same time, Star Trek is like, let's be stressful. Let's be, you know, let's be unhappy. And I just thought that was a mistake. Yeah, Good. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, waiting for those COVID movies to come out. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> My COVID movie will be I'm sitting at home a lot. That's it. <laughs> so, so far, honestly, Catherine and I are just feeling terribly guilty because um, we already work at home. And we are already having uh, groceries delivered and food delivered virtually every night. So um, we're having slightly more food delivered. Um, you know, and here in California, I can get weed delivered. It's brilliant. Mm -hmm. I just call them up. And they're actually much more, they're faster than pizza. And you can track them on your phone as they come. We'll be there in 30 minutes. With your emergency pot. <laughs> so, at some weird level, my life hasn't changed much, except that we can't uh, fly off and have vacation in Europe. Well, boo hoo, poor baby. You know, meanwhile, our daughter's uh, checking groceries in uh, Marin County, a job she's uh, decided to stay in despite the fact we told her we're, you know, we're partially supporting her anyway because she's in fucking Marin County. Um, she's not going to live on grocery store pay. But, yeah, she's like, no. no stick with it so we're like okay cool do that so we're worried about her and we're worried about clara who's living in oakland and doing god knows what because clara doesn't tell us anything um <laughs> most of the time so but you know 23 and uh, i remember what i was doing at 24 and 25 and just say whatever you're doing if you haven't been arrested yet that's good uh entertain yourself have fun <laughs> um okay got another question shoot me another question if you have one yeah, uh, we have another question about, is there anything you're working on right now that, that you can tell us about or want to talk about? I've been going through the weirdest fucking time, to be honest with you. Uh, so Catherine is carrying the ball at this point. Uh, she's got work coming out of her ears. Uh, she's got a book coming out called Willa Dean. Uh, she's got another in the now what is going to be the Ivan Trilogy um, and uh, other stuff. She's got books lined up uh, from here till, till Sunday. I've been given off. I've been given a couple of years off. I realize it's exactly on, on the same schedule as the last time when I was like, that's enough. I'm out of here. I'm going to go do political media. So I was like, I'm going to see about uh, Hollywood. So partly we're trying to get the Gone TV thing done. Uh, not helped by COVID, by the way, since the other two major elements of it are in the UK. Um, and we can't even get together in physical space, let alone go and pitch people. Uh, so we're, we're all kind of on hold with that. And the other is I thought, well, I'll write, uh, maybe I'll write screenplays or something. Because... In my naivete, I thought writing a screenplay would be kind of like writing a book. And here's how writing a book goes. 
and and I've been extraordinarily privileged. So most of what I've done on my own has been for Catherine Teagan, which is at Harper Collins, and Catherine's you know like the smartest person in publishing, and a uh, friend, and uh, knew better than to nickel and dime me over chicken shit. You know, she was like, okay, yeah, you do that. And in the publishing world, notes or editorial notes from a from an editor are in the nature of suggestions. And sometimes they're strong suggestions. Uh, sometimes the suggestions you have to fight over, you know, and, and often they're right and you're wrong. You know, that happens. Um, but out here, that's not how that works, baby. And I had this confirmed. We were on a, Catherine and I on a phone call because uh, with some producers who were looking at one of her properties and um, with two writers on there. We were joking and saying exactly that. And the producer was on the call. He was a lovely guy. Nevertheless, let me just jump in here. You two, the other two writers, the two uh, movie writers, don't get any ideas. In Hollywood, notes are not a suggestion. And I thought, oh, so out here, these are, they're really much more like employees. And we're at the, like I said, the extreme end of, of doing our own fucking thing and not good at hierarchies, to put it mildly. Um, both of us have walked out in the middle of a shift at a restaurant, never to return. Catherine, with the immortal words, you can take this job and shove it up your fucking ass. Uh, out of a place in Annapolis, Maryland. And uh, me, a little bit uh, less obscenely, but just more like, here's my tickets. I'm leaving. You can't leave. And yet, I can. <laughs> Bye. Just walk out the door. So we're very good at leaving shit. Um, so what, were, what am I working on right now? So I'm thinking, I was thinking about uh, movie scripts. And I wrote a couple. And I may put them all up online someday. Just to more or less teach myself the job. Teach myself how to do it. And I don't love the writing, to be honest with you. There's no point at which I can um, kick it into high gear uh, because it's so chopped up, because it's uh, because you have to stop and go, interior, so-and-so's house. Yeah. Yeah. And now I uh, describe the room uh, and here's the guy and that's it. It's, it's like more mechanical. And again, you've heard me wax poetic about TV movie writing, so I admire it, I think it's great. Um, but it's not writing that I'm thrilled with. It's not, it, there's no, there's no flow to it. I can't, and it's so, it's one of the things I miss about when I'm writing books, um, there's, there's chapters I've written where I barely know I've written it just because I'm so there. I'm just, I'm just in it. And my little fingers are my two are flying over the keyboards as fast as I can possibly go. And I just find I can't do that here. Uh, and I, and I miss that. And I, and I also realized that if you write a screenplay, you, if you write a book, you have the book. There it is. And it's yours. You did it. Somebody else did the cover and the marketing and set the type, but you, that's you. You made that. And with movies, you didn't make shit. The director made it. So you wrote it and somebody else came along and said, hi, I'm the actor. I see the character this way. And somebody else came along and said, that set you thought in your head, that's not going to work for our set design. Uh, we're going to do it this way. And then the director comes along and does something completely different than you had in mind. And it's their movie. It's not yours. Um, you can you can claim it. So I wrote that. And indeed, you will have written it. But it seems to me like the proportion of time wasting meetings to actually getting something done is way too big. And I, I much preferred, I mean, it's an exaggeration to say that I could just call Catherine Teagan up on the phone. Um, but it, it was almost like that. I could say, you know, I got this idea. And she'd either go, yeah, or, you know, eh, eh. Go, okay, let's do that. Give me some money and then we'd move from there and a year later you know uh, or six months later she'd have a manuscript and a year later i'd have a book and the whole thing was compressed and it was tough because i my main working experience prior to becoming a writer was as a waiter and you have a very short reward cycle you know you wait on a table there's the tip you wait on another table there's the tip and and you know exactly what the hell's going on and so i kind of had that in you know my head that that's the way things ought to be uh, or at least you know wait a week for a paycheck um, and this was, so it was very, it was a very different kind of like, long story short. I, I think I was, I may have been chasing a car. I didn't want to catch. In other words, I'm, I'm considering that right now. So the top party will still be gone TV if we get that somehow approved. Um, and the odds are very long against it. Um, uh, otherwise, uh, Catherine and I are talking about something we might do together and we have, done some things somewhat together since then like endling um the uncredited co-author of of endling the endling books um 
and when you read them, you'll see why, because they're very much more plot heavy and that's kind of more my thing. Um, but we're thinking about something in the middle grade uh, space <clears throat> that would be a, a, a true K.A. Applegate um, kind of product, a la Animorphs, a la Everworld and Remnants, that, that whole, that feel, that vibe, we're thinking about it. But that's like a, a three day old idea at this point. So yeah, who knows? Well, hopefully we'll see it, but <laughs> we won't yeah. press you on it. <laughs> I, I, there's nothing, there's no more to say. I mean, that's it, that's we got. It's just more like, how about we do something like that? And, okay, let's do something like that. Let's figure that out. We'll see. Oh, that's great. All right, well, we're close to time, so we won't keep you too mm -hmm. much longer, but I'll ask you one more super self-serving question. And um, sure. that's basically that we've decided like with our podcast, we are, we did the whole book series. We're finishing up the TV show right now. And uh, we're just deciding, like, we want to go more into your work and into Catherine's work. And did you have oh, a cool. book series that you think that we should go into next from here? Like, if you have a recommendation? Out of Animorphs, of one of ours or somebody else? Just any of the books that you guys have written. Um, I don't know. I would actually be interested in, well, either Frontlines or Berserk from, from my point of view. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to think from Catherine's she's just she's writing such a different kind of thing you know she's writing she's she's writing a different kind of thing um and so I don't quite know I I know that uh, a lot of her stuff is in development which is the term of art for somebody had a meeting with us <clears throat> and then nothing happened um so um Endling is in development is, is there. They're looking at that. They're looking at Wish Tree. The Wish Tree more seriously. Netflix is actually put some money behind that. Um, That's awesome. So either of those, I mean, certainly would be great. If you haven't read Ivan, um, you, could, you could look at Ivan compared to the movie. We were very pleased with the movie um, because it, it was not an easy, it's not an easy story to do in a movie. It's, mm -hmm. it's basically, you know, talking gorilla in a cage in a mall. And, you know, 90 minutes of that could get old real quick. So the screenwriter and the director in particular did a really great job of opening it up. And whoever did the CGI. <sighs> there's, I, I swear to God, we saw this at a screening at Disney. This would be pre-COVID. So we went down, it was just the two of us uh, and Catherine's agent. And then Sam Dickerman, who's exactly lurking in the back of the room. We didn't know it. Uh, and watching this thing. And I entirely at one point forgot that this was CGI that's how good Ivan is. That's how good you look in his eyes. And there's a particular point where they have this, it's nothing but, you know, pixels, uh, you know, animated by ones and zeros. And they put so much emotion into this gorilla's eyes. He goes through three distinct emotional states in about 10 seconds in response to something. And you can, and you can see it all on his face and just think, wow, somebody's doing some, somebody's doing some amazing work at a keyboard yeah. you know, to get, to get that to happen. Uh, and we were lucky we got to go see it being filmed in uh, UK. And that was kind of, yeah, that was kind of cool. Kind of fun. Neat. Okay, we got uh, time for one more, if you got anything else. <laughs> Casey, you got anything? Um, I think, I did think of one. Um, there's a character in Frontlines that I think, Alex, you mentioned that you wondered if that was like an homage to Rachel and her sister. Rachel, the older sister that died. <laughs> it was a, it was a, I do that sometimes. That's a, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a call out person. Okay. Yeah. They the, were the sad thing is I include all kinds of Easter eggs and then I forget what they are. Mm -hmm. I forget them. And then somebody goes, and I go, oh yeah, that's right. I was bored that day. And so I stuck something silly in there. <laughs> um, yeah. Sometimes it's delivered. Sometimes it's just accidental. And sometimes you just like the name, you know, so you just end up using a name mm -hmm. more than once. Um, there's, I, I will say this about front lines. There's a character in there who's, uh, I don't want to give anything away, homosexual, let's say, in the category of either gay or lesbian, uh, generically, who I tried like hell to figure out how to out, you know, to deal with in the process of the story. And I couldn't because it's 1944. <clears throat> and because, you know, that kind of revelation would have meant a plane trip home right then, right then and possibly jail. And yeah. I couldn't imagine that my, even the characters that I'd written were more sympathetic. I still wanted to make them of that time. And, uh, you know, somebody like Rio is, she's a small town girl from North, from Northern California. And she's had her eyes open to a lot. 
but you know, she's still a small town girl from Northern California in 1944. And so she wasn't going to like turn around and go, Oh, you're gay. Cool. Um, it would be, it, I couldn't handle it in a way that I would be happy with. So there's that adds to the list of uh, shit that I wish I could have done that I couldn't figure out how to do. Yeah. Okay. We're, I think we're there. Yep, I think we're at time. time. Yep. yep. Okay. <laughs> Guys, this has been a trip. It's been fun. I hope yeah. you liked it. Uh, send me a link if you put it up somewhere. Absolutely. Thank you so I much would... for doing this. I yeah, really appreciate you. it so much. Looking forward to it. It's, it's the afternoon. Honestly, by this time of day, I'm either doing housework or getting high. So either way, <laughs> yeah. this is much more. Why not that? <laughs> Better than one, certainly. We'll see about the other. Sure. Okay, take it easy. All right. Have a good <laughs> one. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye.